Welcome to the Daily Dev Talk with me, Adrian Nanchev, where we explore and share experiences, stories and lessons seven days a week from across the games industry, helping you make the best game you can. Stay tuned for today's episode. Good morning, Overload Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Daily Dev Talk, where I talk to game developers from across the world to bring you experiences, stories and lessons seven days a week. Today, I am joined with Chris McCauley from Solitude Entertainment to talk about his first game, Hydronic Empire. Chris, talk about yourself first. How did you get into the games industry? To be honest, uh, I was playing regular Nintendo when I was a little kid and playing Super Mario, and I had always just wanted to make video games. I went to school for it, uh, Cal State Fullerton, uh, got my degree, and uh, started making games. That's, that's really, it's always what I wanted to do. Uh, it's been my goal since, like I said, I was three or four years old. So you literally just jumped straight into it? Oh, um, I worked in websites for a while just trying to earn money to, to do video games. So, um, you know, just trying to save up as much as I can to, to get to the point where I can fund video games and stuff. Um, that's, I spent, what, eight years doing websites and trying to do video games on the side and then finally got enough, uh, Funding to uh, to just go straight for it. So, hmm. Um. So, what are the kind of games you worked on before? Like, you would have done a few global game jams, surely, and maybe one or two at university as practice. Um. So, I made another tower defense game. It's actually on Windows Phone. Uh, it's called Dublin RTD. Um. And you know, it has four star rating, but it's just a small game, and it's all two D kind of. Uh, more on the hard side, but anyway. Uh, and then at uh, college, I worked on a lot of little stuff, but nothing that ended up finished or published. Um, just little like action games or top-down uh, dual stick shooter kind of little ideas that didn't really pan out, to be honest. Um, mm. So, mm. but little stuff like that. Yeah, I can understand that. Start somewhere in good practice. So tell me about Solitude Entertainment. Is it just a one-man band, or is it a good few people? Or what's um, the structure like, so and how many people? We have three people, including myself. Um, we have Jordan Porazari is a, a programmer, and we have Kyle Peters is an artist. Um, and Kyle is a wonderful artist. I mean, he did all of the art all by himself for this game. So as you see the game, every piece of it is him. And Jordan, uh, he's he's the newest member, and he's he's really working out really well, um, becoming good friends, and, and it's been kind of a good work environment with him. So um, he's on to help keep me on task because I get a little off task sometimes. And you know all these people personally, or is it from online? So Kyle um, has been working with me for on and off a little stuff, uh, and he helps with me with Del- Delinar. Uh, for like five years so um, currently he's here full-time um, and for the foreseeable future should be uh, Jordan um, also went to Cal State Fullerton uh, we just put out an ad looking for people willing to do video games and and stuff like that and he answered the call along with a lot of other people and he was our best candidate and he's been with us for three or four months I'm not quite sure don't remember um, but it's working out extremely well. He's a great programmer and uh, very, very adept. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's talk about the game, Hydronic Empire, and what did you want the player to experience? So as with tower defense games, typically they're um, kind of a puzzle game in a way, insofar as it's it's a, it's a strategy game. It's a little bit of we, – we added a, a builder, so you have a little bit of action involved, but – Really, it's a puzzle. And so you have a certain set of mobs that come out, and you have a certain set of towers that you can put down. So you're looking for the right combination to beat the combination of of enemies coming. So what we wanted people to experience was the ability to see what was coming. We have like a mob bar. Everybody can see what's coming out. And then to solve the puzzle. So we want you to feel like you've solved something. We want you to feel like you've accomplished... um, something with every level that you play so that it's not so easy that you just walk through it but it's also not so hard that you kind of rage that's at least our goal 
So we've, we've been slowly trying to balance back and forth. And that's kind of why we're in early access right now is to balance that out a bit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I liked about it straight away is you control the path that the enemy has. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that very often, I don't think. Yeah. Because you can, right. it, it starts off with a direct linear path straight from the end, uh, from start to the end. But then, you know, if, if you do it correctly, you can have them diverted all over the place and delayed, which is which just means extra time to take them down before they get to the objective. Yeah. And I, and I like the idea of having a builder, a character in there. As long as the character doesn't get killed, I don't think he does. He doesn't. I don't think so. And I like it because he has that extra ability, and there's also that delay when it comes to building the stuff. So it's not like the other ones, about to say generic, but the older ones where you click some click an area and you build the object, the machine gun, for example, and it builds straight away. Right. You, in this one, you've got to have a character that walks over there to build it for you. Right. So he needs to stop activating a spell or finish building elsewhere and get over there and build the next one, which is cool. It really is different from all the tower defense games. Well, I'm glad you like it. We were, we were The biggest reason we put the builder in is, is just what you said, is it adds a whole other level of, uh, of thought and strategy in order to, to solve said puzzle of mm -hmm. each level. So. Yes, <laughs> yes. So how did you go about promoting the game, and what strategies worked for you and what didn't? To be honest, we're just starting that process, um, so we haven't done a whole lot. We have, uh, right now, Indie Gala is going to do a bundle with us on the 17th of August, um, and we're hoping that'll help out. We don't have a huge marketing budget, to be honest. It's, it's, it's incredibly small. We were trying to get into packs. We didn't get into packs yet, at least. Um, we'll try to get into the next packs. So this is uh, PAX Prime. I think the next one is PAX in texas so pack cell um so we plan on doing some trade shows uh we missed e3 we just weren't quite ready yet didn't have a demo out they didn't want us there yet which i understand that that i get it um but really the trade shows is what we're going to do um i'm not really a great marketer to be honest i am a computer scientist so that's one of the things we're learning the most if anybody had any tips for us love to hear them um hmm. that's where we're at well, I just want to go off topic for a little moment. You said Indie Gala, right? Mm -hmm. And I've done about this. This is my twentieth interview, and I'm starting to notice a pattern with all the other game studios and people who are like one man ba one man bands or like teams of ten or something. And it's it's that this really highlights the idea that video games can be made in small teams anywhere in the world, right? At next to nothing cost. Well, not next to nothing, but quite relatively cheap. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's amazing that you can create a game. You've used Unity, I can I can tell. Nope. You, that's oh okay. No, we have a custom game engine based on Mono Game. Okay, that's fine. Um, but you know, three guys made the game that I don't know how long it took you. Probably new, so a few months, probably three or something. Four. And then boom, Very close. four. And then you suddenly on Indie Gala, and then you had the potential to be on E3, and it's like this little small this innovation, this enterprise and enterprise enterprise can be all over the world just like that and there's an article recently that steam sells an average of 32 the game sells an average of 32,000 copies i don't know if that's over a year or whatever but I think it's over the lifetime say, yeah ah okay even still that's if you times that by say ten dollars or five dollars even one dollar that's that's pretty nifty not that much not too bad nothing to yeah nothing to dismiss so it's like you get a nice little game that you would want to play that's why i think it's important that you'd want to play it and it's on there, and it's 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 a viable business in in on in on of itself, right? And that's amazing. That is just amazing. So, speaking of which, how did you go about funding the game? What worked and what didn't work? So, basically, any money that I made from websites over the last eight years, anything extra, uh, has gone into either developing the game engine or working on projects that did or did not pan out. Um, and then uh, I was able to secure an angel investor um, in order to fund the rest of the game and actually keep us funded for a while to keep us going and, and let us uh, really work out the kinks and, and get more games pumped out. Um, so you can definitely be expecting more games after this one from us. Uh, we're actually doing a Game Jolt next Friday. They have Game Jolt has a, like a quick three day yeah three day 72 hour um game jam and we'll be doing that 
see what comes out of that. Hopefully something good. Um, if not, well, then we'll move on to the next thing. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we ended up with an angel investor to, to fund the rest, but I've been funding it for eight years on my own. And honestly, that doesn't work very well. It just takes too much time and you can never quite get enough money to do what you're trying to do. But mm-hmm. picking up an investor or, you know, uh, winning a game competition would be great. Uh, we just, they never really lined up well for us, you know? but you know, that's, I know how some of the Indies do it. And I think that's a great way to do it as well. But really what you need is somewhere between 30 and a hundred thousand dollars saved up and you can pretty much make any indie game that you really want to. So. Mm-hmm. And just quickly, clarif- quickly clarify, please, Chris, what angel investor is ah. the audience out there. Yeah. So like an angel investor is an investor that doesn't really want to interfere with what you're doing in your company. So they give you money and they're just like any other investor. They expect a return. Um, but not necessarily quite as strict as a lot of investing is done. A lot of investors are looking for a return within like two years. Sometimes if a really nice one's looking for it within three years. Um, and some more harsh ones are looking for it with six months to a year from, from when you get the investment. An angel investor typically is a little bit more lax. Um, and they don't want to be in your way when you develop. So you're still able to, to run things the way you want to run it, I guess, is, is the best way I can can put it it's always a viable alternative yeah so ab- about the game what was cut from it and why oh well, we cut quite a few things um we cut things just based on time i mean we want to this this game is really a proof of concept that our engine is ready um and uh because some parts weren't as ready as we thought it was we ended up you have to cut some things. Uh, we originally planned uh, 26 levels. We went down to 21. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, we were hoping to put in uh, an extra too many bosses than we're going to be able to. We'll have one, but we were hoping to put in three. And then uh, we were hoping to do two bosses. We're only going to end up being able to do one. So stuff like that, we just simply uh, ran out of our time that we were looking for, that we had budgeted for this game. Um, and we can always put those in. Provided the game does well, we will put them in for the users. Um, it just at some point you have to say, well, we're we're over time budget. It's time to uh, to make some hard decisions and make sure that the game we wanted is still there, but maybe missing just a few of the niceties that we might have had. Um, another thing, what else did we cut from the game? We cut. I'm trying to remember, there was something different about the builder. That we cut out. Boy, it's been a long time. Hard to remember some of these things. Um, but yeah, we definitely made some cuts, not huge ones, but just cut a few levels, cut a few mobs, um, and uh, kind of keep going. We've we've got the vast majority of everything we we set out to put in. In. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, what was the biggest thing you learned while working on the game? Uh, that no matter how ready you think you are when you're writing a new engine, there's still more to put in. Uh, there's all, it's <laughs> always more, um, that, and we're learning globalization and we're learning it the hard way right now. Uh, just making sure that the XML files load properly, believe it or not, was a little bit more, more than I thought it was going to be. So we have, I've been working for a few days with, uh, a few German people that have been willing to help us and let us team viewer into their computers so that we can test the game and see what it's doing and grab the error reports out of the event viewers and all that kind of stuff. And I think I've got it fixed. I think I fixed it this morning, so I haven't heard anything negative back yet. But that's been a that's been an adventure. Mm-hmm. That kind of ties in with the next question. So what was the worst thing that happened, and how did you overcome it? That is the worst thing that's happened. Uh, just getting that that uh, post saying the game does not work, you know, and you're just going, oh, no, that's the worst thing I could possibly hear, you know, not, oh, there's this little bug here, and maybe this animation doesn't run properly. This was, your game doesn't work. And uh, we w- were lucky enough that the the community of Steam was, was willing to work with us and help us out, 
because, you know, this is our first game and we didn't know. We thought we were doing globalization right. We weren't. It's just that simple. And uh, that's been a learning experience. And it was very uh, scary to me to see those words. Your game doesn't work. Because um, we tested all over the place, you know, all kinds of hardware. We've got it tested all the way down to the Surface 3, not the Pro 3, the Surface 3. We've got it tested up in, on NVIDIA stuff, on Asus cards, on AMD cards. We tested as much as we possibly could, but we didn't get the globalization right. So, but I think we fixed it. I'm hoping we fixed it. I'm hopeful, very hopeful, but we'll see. Well, I played the game with no problems. Mm, that's good. Makes me happy. So what was the best game development related purchase, whether it was a software license, a top quality piece of hardware or equipment, or a comfortable chair and a good desk? Uh, well, I can't stress this comfortable chair and the good desk enough. Um, you're going to be sitting in this chair for 8 to 16 hours a day. Um, mm. And the desk, personally, I used to have all kinds of back problems. Bought a good desk, three-tier desk, keeps the hands below your... your uh, 90 degree angle of your shoulders and your neck up so that the, the monitors are raised and the keyboard's lowered and it just it really does help a lot um get a nice chair if you're gonna do this spend 100 or 200 dollars on a chair you're you're gonna love yourself for it later um but as for like programs you know i mean we had to buy maya for the artist we had to buy visual studios you know, you have to buy these things. Uh, I would say that if you're trying to do this without Visual Studios, I think you're nuts. But that's just my opinion. Oh, yeah. You, you can if you want code in a Notepad. Yeah. But you know, why why make it hard for yourself? Yeah, I I can't imagine trying to do any of this uh, without Visual Studios. It's just so nice compared to other IDEs like uh, Java has plenty of them, Eclipse and all that kind of stuff. They're just not even near the level of niceness that visual studios is um and we've just i know a i know a little bit about code like inheritance and variables and um, voids and loops and all the rest mm -hmm. what, what does i ide stand for again uh i figure what the i is but it's development environment so basically uh okay i forget what the i part is but yeah it's visual studios and that kind of stuff uh Look it up. Yeah. To be honest, uh, I, don't, I don't remember. Integrated development environment. So I is. Well, I, I I totally forgot about it until you just mentioned it. I've not touched code in years, and the last one I touched was Unreal script. Ah. And it's like since then, it's like no, I've, I'm not programming. No. Nope. I'll, I'll stick to me. animation. There you go. No, thanks. No yeah. code is not me. So, do you have any game development related book, lecture, or learning resource that you can recommend? You know, I'll be honest. The respective community that you're going to be in typically has enough information to get you through. So if you're doing unity, there's a unity forum and it's, it does a great job. We're personally not doing unity. Um, we're doing mono mono game and you know what, they have their own community and they do a great job. Um, it's a wonderful environment. Like we used to do X and a and everything, the entire X and a community, all the forum posts going all the way back to 2008 are all valid information, or at least most of them are valid information to help you out with um and uh you know so we're part of that crowd and we built our own game environment up on top of that with the help of the community so wow that sounds that sounds cool that's great to know like an evernote or a trello do you have a useful or productivity enhancing software app extension or website worth sharing you know um, being as I did websites for a long time, I typically write my own productivity apps for better or for worse. Um, sometimes it works out great. Sometimes not so much. Um, but I can tell you team viewer is wonderful for checking out people's stuff on their own computers. We use that, like I said, to solve, uh, this globalization issue. Uh, I used it with friends and family trying to see how their game was running on, on their hardware rather than on mine. Um, Team Viewer is pretty, pretty wonderful. Uh, and then, I mean, Basecamp's okay. There needs to be better uh, task, management soft, task management software out there, but I can't really seem to find too much that's awesome, but Basecamp's all right. Um, and then Gchat. So Gchat's pretty awesome. I know there's a lot of substitutes out there, but just to 
be able to chat back and forth when you're not at the office is helpful. Okay, cool. So it's all about debugging the game remotely and checking out it's all performing. Well, it helps. I mean, as a, as an indie studio, you don't have 500 computers with all all with different hardware to to test the game on. So in order to see some of the the bugs or the errors or why this Nvidia card's not doing what you expect it to with your shader or that AMD card's not doing what you expect it to with the shader, um, you kind of have to have kind of a a group of people, and I have a large family, and so do you know some of the people around here. And we were able to to test it on their hardware because they did own the hardware, and so um, it's helpful. I know the big AAA companies; they got hundreds of computers that they can test things on. We don't have that, so. Mm-hmm. Okay, and speaking of the game, I really like the art style in it. Um, when I used to do modeling, like three D for mm-hmm. like character and environment, this is the kind of artwork that. It looks compact and beautiful in its own way. It looks it looks efficient and yet at the same time slightly stylized and not quite not quite as as good as others out there, but it's good in its own way, which is beautiful. And it and I think this kind of artwork inspires people just to oh I can I can model something like that or I can texture that I can create a little minigun or something like that or I can do a little zeppelin. Right. It's it's just beautiful in its own way. And speaking of which, do you have any advice? for aspiring game developers, small indie studios, or people trying to get to where you are today? Just go for it. I mean, yeah. if you don't try, you'll never get there. And if you put it off like I did for years, trying to earn enough, it's it's almost impossible. So find a way to put together the money and then go for it. Quit your job and just go for it. If you're trying to do two things at once, you'll never get there, in my opinion. Um, and that's at least from my experience. I'm sure there's 10 other experiences out there that disagree with me, but that that's my advice to people. Cool. I agree. And to be honest, over the past uh, like 20 or so days of me doing this, well, not even that, uh, these interviews, I've really had the idea of creating some of my own games to just get back into it, doing a few other things and building a business or two. But um, thinking about it, Creating like a, a business simulator of mine or something of the sort where it's a game that I would want to play. Right. So my audience, my target customer is people like me. I think it's the easiest way. If I'm if I would like to play the game, other people like me in any demographic would, would like it as well. So I have thought about that as well. Yeah. Just do it, yeah. And with seven billion yeah. people on this planet, there are plenty of people that like things that you like. You know, that's oh yeah. That's just oh, a yeah. given. You know? Mm. Yeah, just for sheer numbers. Yeah, and a few hundred million of them are in the West, so the US and Europe and such. So, oh yeah, you know the, num- the numbers are quite good. So thirty-two thousand is, uh, I don't know, I think that's a good game. If you can, if you can get one game every six months, then I think over the course of five years, that's pretty nice. You get better, better and better. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And as you get better, I'm sure you'll get more fans and more followers that, and you'll sell more and more and more eventually. At least that's the hope, you know. Yeah, you entertain more and more because the way I see it is that uh, not to not to think of it as making money, but think of it as be a studio and people whom people want to do business with, like this interview, and create a game that you yourselves would enjoy and that you would play, mm-hmm. and so you have more passion for it. Because and as Steve Jobs says that if any rational person doesn't have the passion, they would quit and leave. She's right. I mean, he's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. So, Chris, what is next for you, and what's the best way to contact you? So, uh, like I said, we're doing a, a Game Jolt Game Jam on the 17th through the 19th, and we'll be posting whatever it is that comes out of that. Um, we don't even know what the topic will be because it hasn't been posted yet. So uh, that's what's absolutely next. After that, we, uh, we're we finishing up this game. We're going to get it released. We're going to get it all taken care of, make sure we support it for as long as people want to play it, and... Um, move on to our next game as well at the same time. Um, we are looking to do some something that's party-based and roguelike in a way. Obviously, roguelike is not supposed to be party-based, but just, you know, taking from both genres and, and moving forward in that direction. So um, that's at least what's scheduled next. We'll see what comes out of this game, Joel. That might change things up a little bit. But, uh, yeah, that's next. Uh, contacting... Me or us in general, um, we have a contact form on our website, solitudegames.com. Um, I 
you can contact us on Steam. Um, and, I mean, my email is chris at solitudegames.com. So uh, I'm there. If you have a question, I'm willing to answer it. Um, past that, I think that's probably enough to, to get a hold of us for sure. And I've answered every single email that's come through our contact form, and I don't plan on stopping. So, Well, that's great to hear, Chris. But it appears that we're out of time for this episode of the Daily Dev Talk. Great to talk to you. Great, great, uh, a lot of stuff to talk, uh, a lot of stuff to think about. And wish really wish you well on future endeavors. Thank you. Stay tuned, Overload Nation. More videos to come. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Daily Dev Talk with me, Adrian Nanchev. If you are a game developer that wants to get your name and game out there and to share your experiences and stories, or you have feedback or opinions of the show, then contact me at info at gameoverload.co.uk. That's info at gameoverload.co.uk. Stay tuned for tomorrow's episode. More to come.